Oh, the very thing you talked about. <laughs> if you happen to notice that the tankers are stacking up, meaning there are multiple tankers are waiting to be filled, there could be a couple things going on there. Number one, a rumble! <laughs> <laughs> if your community lacks a pressurized municipal water supply system, the fire department is tasked with bringing the water from their fire headquarters to the fire scene. This is primarily done through the use of mobile water supply apparatus, often referred to as tankers or tenders. For the sake of this segment today, we are going to utilize the term tanker to describe the vehicle throughout the rest of this program. When these tankers deliver this water to the fire scene, they offload the water at the scene through different methods to aid in the suppression process of the fire operation. Once the tanker has offloaded this water at the fire scene, the tanker must take up from that location and move on to a fill site to be refilled to bring water back in a shuttle formation back to the fire ground operation. A few considerations to keep in mind when selecting a fill site. One, we would try to get a fill site that's more than capable of delivering that thousand gallons per minute. That being said, if the site cannot deliver that volume of water and we can still be close to the fire scene, that's a situation where I would rather us have quicker access to that water, not passing that static source to get it on the fire ground quicker than traveling a greater distance just to achieve that thousand gallon a minute. Another consideration is will there be ample room for the apparatus to park. As you see in this video, we have a decent amount of space where the apparatus can safely approach and depart the location. The fire crew members or the fill site crew members can easily make and break connections and there's good visibility in the roadway and the area where they're operating. Another point, if possible, close the roadway to any civilian traffic through the use of our municipal police department, fire department people, whoever that may be, we want to secure that roadway to keep it safe. Okay. Even though these are rural country roads many times, there is still the opportunity for civilian vehicles to come through the area, often not heeding the warnings and putting our fire personnel in danger. So that's a real critical point that we want to make sure that we secure that scene. Some of these locations could also be fire hydrants, underground cisterns, and then of course that static source, lakes, ponds, streams, rivers, even sometimes a swimming pool. Once these areas have been identified, it's good practice to have those locations put in some form of pre-plan book, a binder that could be shared with your mutual aid partners so when those apparatus respond to the scene, they understand what the location is and how the fill site will be set up. Once these locations have been identified and that information has been shared with your mutual aid partners, a good practice on any fire alarm dispatch for a structure fire is to have an engine company dispatched solely for the purpose of setting up that fill site. If the engine company is delayed in getting there and tankers are now empty arriving at the fill location, there will be a delay in getting that water to the fire scene. This obviously is dictated by the number of engine companies in your area and the number of personnel that would be available to even do this setup. Best practice when available to send two engine companies there. Part of that engine company is set up to get the drafting equipment in line while the other portion or the second company will be there to aid in the loading of the incoming tankers. A couple other things that are really important when we talk about these fill sites is we want to be able to build a fill site that is dependable, repeatable, and predictable. And what we mean by that is the companies that are coming in, do we have standardized connections? It doesn't really matter what you decide to do in your region it just the most important factor here is that everyone is consistent and doing the same thing. If the decision is made to fill with dual three inch lines, then try to be consistent across the fleet. There could be other situations or other jurisdictions that want to fill with large diameter hose. Again, it really doesn't matter which direction you go, but just to be consistent throughout the operation so that the incoming companies can be compatible with that operation for success. In this segment, we will be utilizing multiple medium diameter hose lines for filling these tankers. The configuration to set this up is there is some source engine that has been put in place to capture that water and feed a supply line to the gated manifold. The manifold receives the five inch line 
or large diameter hose, depending on what you have in your jurisdiction. On one side of the manifold, two 50-foot sections of three-inch hose will be attached to the manifold and run out to a fixed location, traditionally marked with some type of road cone or a visible marker, that will give the tanker driver some type of location or a guiding point where they can stop the apparatus. As the apparatus approaches that location, the tanker fill crew will attach the two lines to the rear of the tanker and begin filling the truck. Oftentimes, with an unfamiliar vehicle coming into your fill site, it might be important to have the driver of the apparatus step out of the vehicle to assist the initial time of getting these hose lines connected. Once the initial process has been determined and the fill crew is confident to do that, there is really no need for the driver to exit the vehicle each time that tanker arrives at the fill site. As the tanker is being filled, if a second tanker is coming into play or is starting to approach your location, the second set of fill lines will have been laid out on the other side of the manifold and also put into position. Spacing as a good rule of thumb is anywhere from 100 to 150 feet between the two fill stations to allow room for the tankers to enter and exit the fill station safely. We try not to have our tankers approach the fill station and have to back up or maneuver several times, wasting time and slowing down the process of refilling the tankers. Even though we may have hose lines connected to both tankers at the fill site, it is critical that we fill one tanker at a time. If the fill site is designed to provide a thousand gallon a minute fill rate, splitting that flow 500 and 500 to each tanker ultimately will slow down that shuttle time. So the rule is the first tanker is connected, those lines are charged, we get water feeding into the first tanker, we'll call it tanker number one. Tanker number two is set up and ready to go, however those lines do not get charged. Once the fill site operator or the person running the manifold recognizes that the first tanker is now full, usually this is an indicator of two things. You'll see some type of light or fill gauge on the vehicle, or the most obvious is the tanker will overflow spilling out onto the ground. As soon as that tanker is full, those valves on the manifold will be closed. The second tanker now, the operator will take that manifold take those two handles and open those valves to start filling the second tanker. The hose lines then need to be disconnected from tanker one, safely pulled off of the roadway to allow the next tanker access to fit into that tanker fill slot. Tanker one leaves for the fire scene, tanker two continues to fill. As the third tanker or the next arriving tanker pulls in, someone should be there as they fill site operator, officer, someone in charge that can designate which fill slot to put that tanker in. As the next arriving tanker arrives, they pull into what we like to refer to it as a pit stall. They bring the tanker in, lining up the tailboard with the cone that has been put down. The reason we like to use the cone in this setup is the rear of the tanker is consistent on every vehicle. Chassis lengths may vary, the size, wheelbase, all that changes, but the rear or the filling port of the truck will always be on the rear of the truck. If an officer or a senior person on the site of the fill location is able to capture data, it's a good thing that we can keep track of the fill times of each of the tankers coming in, the designation on the apparatus, and start to time out how long it's taking to get apparatus from the fill site to the fire scene. Another important thing to keep in mind at a fill site on any large scale water supply operation, if available, designate a specific channel through your communication center or even locally that the water supply team can communicate independently of fire ground operations. There'll be a lot of chatter and a lot of noise on that water supply channel that the fire ground operations really do not need to be involved with. That water supply officer will ultimately report to command on the primary fire channel, but keeping all that extra noise off of the primary band. A few things that need to be kept in mind while at the fill site. On your tanker fill site location, if you happen to notice that the tankers are stacking up, meaning there are multiple tankers awaiting to be filled, there could be a couple things going on there. Number one, the fill rate is not where you want it to be. We're looking for that thousand gallon a minute fill rate. Number two, there's too many apparatus in the cycle and this is a good time to let command know through the water supply officer 
that a secondary and even a third fill site should be set up to accommodate the number of tankers on the incident. And more critical is to monitor how much water is in the source. If our static source has been being used for a long period of time, we might deplete that water source to the point where it's no longer usable. Important things that we need to monitor throughout the evolution of filling these tankers at that fill site. In the rural environment, mobile water supply apparatus, tankers and tenders are a very crucial and critical part of the overall plan for fire suppression. This is one of the most important aspects of training that we need to maintain so that our crews can be efficient in delivering water for the firefighters operating on the scene. Practice in drilling, pre-planning, and understand what our mutual aid partner's capabilities are will ultimately lead to success when setting up a rural water supply operation and the fill site to support the overall fire. If you want to take your water supply skills to the next level and get greedy with your water, reach out to the experts at TFT.com. Thank you for watching.